Yes, that was a great introduction. Elmer highlighted many of my favorite parts of being a pastor at Listowel Church. I also spent a lot of time with his grandchildren in the barn. <laughs> also very fun. <laughs> I've been thinking a lot about change recently. I got started thinking about it because of a historical fiction book that I was reading. It was set in London, England after World War II. The soldiers had come back to London and the protagonist of the story was a woman named Sylvia and she had been employed as a journalist while the war was going on. After the war, she had a hard time finding and keeping work as a journalist as many soldiers had come back and needed employment as well. She found herself facing all sorts of new situations once the soldiers had returned. She had much more competition for jobs and wasn't really equally considered when she applied for those jobs as men were still viewed as the better choice. The soldiers who returned also had a lot of issues to face. They had mental health issues that they would have suffered from and not to mention physical disabilities. These were tremendous and made it difficult for them to even hold down a job. One character in the book who was a soldier was rejected by his fiance because of disfigurement. I have never really considered the major impacts to almost all of life after a world war. Not until we lived through our own global catastrophe. Many things have changed and we aren't quite settled yet. As an example, the world of work has certainly changed. Many now prefer remote jobs where you can have a bit more of a work-life balance. While my work as a guidance counselor isn't completely remote, we are able to work from home on Fridays and other days as needed. It certainly does help with work-life balance to be able to take frozen meat out of the freezer at a decent time and jump right into making dinner once I finish up work with no driving time to consider. The change of COVID though wasn't something that we asked for. It was something that was forced upon us and likely not something we would have chosen ourselves. This is why I've been thinking about change. We've just been through a major change. But I've also been thinking about the many different calls to change that Jesus brings to us. A lot of parables that Jesus shares are an invitation to change. The parable of the speck and the log invites us to deal with our own issues before we judge others. The parable of the mustard seeds invites us to see the kingdom of heaven as a small seed that starts in the darkness and dirt, an unexpected place. The parable of the lost sheep invites us to see God's priorities and adopt them as our own, finding the lost and bringing them in. It's not only the parables that lead us in this direction. The scripture that was read from Romans this morning again says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may dis discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul, too, is teaching us to transform our minds, to change them, to renew them, so that they aren't like others in this world. Our minds need to be different than those around us. This prevents, presents us with many problems. The first problem is that we don't really want to change. We don't want to change the way we think or the way we act. It's easy and comfortable to live our lives the way that they are. Even if things are more healthy for us, if we do them a different way, most people naturally don't want to change. Sometimes knowing something is healthier or better isn't a good enough reason to change. Luckily, or perhaps unluckily, depending on how you look at it, God has designed life to include some natural points at which you will most likely change. 
One of my favorite authors is Father Richard Rohr, and he has the following to say about transformation in one of his daily meditations. Two universal paths of transformation have been available to every human being God has created, great love and great suffering. These are offered to all. Only love and suffering are strong enough to break down our usual ego defenses, crush our dualistic thinking, and open us to mystery. In my experience, they, like nothing else, exert the mysterious chemistry that can transmute us from a fear-based life into a love-based life. None of us are exactly sure why. We do know that words, even good words or fine theology, cannot achieve that on their own. No surprise that the Christian icon of redemption is a man offering love from a crucified position. End quote. Great love and great suffering are two things that can truly get through to us, even when we really do not want to change. One of these options we want, and the other we don't. It's a bit of a fail-safe for divine transformation in our lives. I don't think this means that we can't actively grow outside of great love and great suffering. I sure hope not, or else we might all be facing a lot of suffering. <laughs> this leads me to the second problem, which is that we are told to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. But the how isn't always there. Parables don't really include a how either. Later on in Romans 12, Paul discusses love in action and says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. This isn't even the full list of things he wants you to be like in Romans 12, just part of it. I just want to look at Paul and say, how, how do you want me to go about doing this to-do list of things that is 13 verses long? And that's just one part of Romans 12. That doesn't even include the rest of the entire Bible. I was recently in a session with a psychotherapist called New Perspectives on Self-Care. And something that really struck me was the presenter's example of how to form habits from the book Tiny Habits by B.J. Fogg. Fogg studies habits and gives us an example of flossing your teeth in his book. He does not like flossing and never wants to do it. Through his research, he's discovered, I see some people also agree that flossing is terrible. <laughs> I also agree. <laughs> Through his research, he's discovered that if you want to change a habit, the first step is to tie it to something that you're already regularly doing. For Fogg, he was brushing his teeth every night. So he chose to tie the flossing to brushing his teeth. The next key to create a habit was to make the task ridiculously easy. Fogg chose to start by just flossing one tooth. Really, if you are going to start flossing, flossing one tooth is the lowest bar you could set for yourself. <laughs> the idea is that gradually, over time, as you tie your new habit to your current habit and start small and easy, you'll build up to more. Eventually, one tooth will just be too easy. And you'll add another tooth and another until you find you're doing your entire mouth. The final step in this method is to make sure you give yourself a little reward after completing each task. The reward I mean, I would like it to be eating some chocolate, but it's supposed to be more like giving yourself a high five, doing a dance, or just getting excited that you did this one task. If you keep this up, your mind will soon relate flossing to the feeling of elation when you give yourself a high five. This helps you feel good about what you've done. 
If you're beating yourself up for only doing one tooth, you're not going to feel very great about your new habit. This example obviously works well with a physical task that you may want to complete, like flossing. Flossing is an action that our dentist says we should do daily, but it's just you and your teeth. It becomes a little harder when we talk about changing our worldview on something, or maybe becoming uh, stronger in the fruits of the spirit, for example. But I think it could be done. Let's say if we use the fruits of the spirit, one of those is peace. And maybe we want to grow in peace. Perhaps the ongoing challenges of this world are really getting to us. And we'd like to invite some peace into our lives to bring balance. We can pick a habit that we're already doing, like eating lunch. Now we need to pick a very easy activity that can help bring peace into our lives. Perhaps we choose to listen to the Be Still Centering Prayer every day at lunch, which you can find on YouTube, but also we'll do it now. Uh, so the Be Still Centering Prayer, if you would like to, we can pray together and I'll lead us through it. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know. Be still. Be. Amen. And then after you've done your centering prayer, you sigh a big sigh of relief and you congratulate yourself on finding some peace today. That's all it has to be. And soon you will be inspired to add more peace to your life in new ways. I think Paul also gives us a significant how that we might gloss over in this scripture. I certainly did until I read over some commentaries on Romans. Verses three to eight of chapter 12 says, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think more highly of yourself than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. I'm usually tempted to read this scripture with a lens of seeing how we can all work together. But also, we could be pointed to the truth that we grow when we're in community with each other. The one of us who has the gift for serving will have a different perspective than the one it is whose gift is to teach. These two have much to learn from each other, just as we all do. To learn in this way, we must come with humility, as Paul says in verse 3. And there is another task that Paul gives us to work on. My third and final issue, probably not the final issue, but final issue today, with change is that there is no timeline in the flossing example who knows how long it'll take to get to your second tooth let alone your entire mouth and this is what has hit me hardest recently about change change is so painfully slow 
However slow you already think change is, think of it being even slower than that. Sometimes individual changes may happen quickly, like a sudden tragedy, but the necessary change that must come into our lives after that can be so, so slow. We can be impatient and quit even, but we must continue forward and accept this inevitable slow pace of change. I suspect that this slow pace is healthy for us. If we could automatically know how to do things, would we even be experiencing true growth or God in that growth? Our continued transition into our post-COVID world will take time too, as now our eyes have been even more opened to the many iniquities raised through the reality of COVID. Working towards resolutions to those iniquities will require much change and maybe even a change that is letting go of the way that we currently do things. I wonder if maybe this week you can consider an area in your life where you might like to grow and commit to an easy action that's tied to a habit that you currently do, as we discussed earlier. So I am saying it out loud. I want to have more healing moments in my life. After the stress of the past several years, we have a lot of grieving and healing to do to help get back to ourselves. And I want to consciously do that. I want to heal. I'm also interested in meditation, but every time I try to do it, I'm terrible at it. And there's an example of beating yourself up, even though you're trying. So I'm going to try one minute, set the bar nice and low. I could go lower, but I'll set it there. I'll try one minute of meditation when I go to bed. Going to bed is something I do every day, and so I will tie it to that. I can program my watch here <laughs> to count to one minute, and I can close my eyes and breathe and let my watch do the counting. After I complete my one minute of meditation, to reward myself, I will excitedly tell my husband Dave that I have reached my goal and I will hope he gives me a high five. <laughs> Change is attainable, despite all the reasons it seems like it shouldn't be. I believe that people can change for the better, including every one of us here. So take some time, think about how you can grow and change and be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Thanks, Paul, for your words. Amen. <laughs>